Hello. Welcome to On the Line. I'm Christine Williams. Coming up for discussion on our Viewpoints Hour. Canada's revamped citizenship guide warning newcomers we won't tolerate barbaric cultural practices. The HST of valid economic stimulus or major tax grab? That's the question. And a look at child poverty in Canada. Stay tuned. And these are the issues we're presenting today to our Viewpoints guests for commentary. Canada has a new revamped citizenship guide entitled Discover Canada, the Rights and Responsibilities of Canadian Citizenship. And it warns newcomers that barbaric cultural practices will not be tolerated. The Ontario Harmonized Tax remains a hard sell for the McGuinty government while it's being pushed as a market stimulus, critics calling it a major tax grab. And the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child was ratified two decades ago. We'll take a look at how Canada is faring according to UNICEF bureaucrats when it comes to child poverty. Now let's meet our Viewpoints guests. Paul McKeever is leader of the Freedom Party of Ontario. Dr. George Breckenridge is a political scientist and professor at McMaster University. And from our studio in Calgary, Matthew Johnston, publisher of the Western Standard. And for you watching, we also consider you a guest, so feel free to call in at any time with any of your comments taking us to the first topic that we're discussing today and that is that's made the major headlines recently newcomers warned no barbaric acts now the question has been raised before and it continues to be raised when it comes to the responsibility of new citizens coming to this country, do they have to have a sense of some responsibility toward Canada coming in? And this particular phrase about barbaric acts, yes, it's raised a few eyebrows. We, we saw a liberal critic come forth and say, well, when you look at the new act, or, or in fact the revamped version of this citizenship manual, so to speak, it tends to eliminate certain things or doesn't include and that's his argument well what about white collar crime he says how come it doesn't include something like that so the question that we're asking you do you find those new guides offensive to newcomers coming into the country you may find that or on the other hand you may be saying it's about time so let us know what you think i'm going to start with you first paul on that one what do you think of the new guidelines for newcomers coming into this country well i've got no objection to them at all uh, however my real question is barbaric practices are done by barbarians and so where is the screening process at the pro at the point at which these people were admitted to canada in the first place i mean if you don't have barbarians in your country you don't have you don't have to tell them not to be barbaric and so to my mind uh, people ought to be, as part of the screening process, interviewed about their views on you know, the dignity and worth of an individual, their rights to life, liberty, and property, and if they think that people are chattel rather than uh, individuals, if they're you know, uh, collectivist in the extreme and not uh, respectful of Western individualist standards, then I think they're a no-go for entry Now, you're Canada. opening up a can of worms there, and that's something <laughs> I'm going to come back to. You better believe it. Dr. Breckenridge, your thoughts on this? I think it would be a good idea. Some people have suggested to give this to people but when they apply to come to Canada. I don't know. I don't think you'll get very far interviewing people. You know, are you going to engage? in barbaric practices, they're not going to say yes. But the, the issue, the main issue is cultural difference, and particularly when it involves the equality of women. Hmm. You know, that's what most of these things are, 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 are about, the, the difficulties are about, the, the difference between some societies from which people come and our society nowadays. Do you think it's about time that something gets included? In oh, I think, I, yeah, I think it's very important to emphasize that women, you know, that we consider women to be equal. And, uh, you know, and they have equal rights with men. And therefore, the, the certain kinds of traditional practices, cultural practices in, in a lot of different countries, and not just in Asia, I mean, it's, this is true of parts of Europe as well, uh, are not acceptable here. You know, and people should know that in advance. Okay, now Matthew Johnston, joining us from our studio out in Calgary, publisher of the Western Standard. Your thoughts on these new guidelines for newcomers coming into Canada? 
Well, I generally agree with uh, comments our, uh, the guests have made uh, so far. Um, you know, check your barbaric cultural practices at the border. It's, it sounds like a good idea. I was impressed by um, by how clear a statement it was, free of sort of cultural relativism, uh, free of political correctness. It was a very direct um, statement. Uh, Paul raises an interesting point. If you have to uh, put something like that into your immigration uh, guidelines, you uh, it makes one uh, question um, our general immigration policy um, if we're concerned about uh, people uh, with barbaric cultural practices perhaps we should take a you know a more disciplined approach to uh, uh, to who we invite um, uh, into the country I also think it's important to draw a distinction between offensive cultural practices and those cultural practices that are truly violent or um, that we would consider criminal by sort of any rational definition of what it means to commit a crime an act of aggression against another person or their property uh, is how I sort of look at um, what would be described as a crime so you know the hijab for example uh, it's offensive uh, to many people it, um, it might even be considered barbaric but uh, it doesn't seem as if uh, the conservative government is targeting people for for cultural practice is that um, you know uh, are different than Western um, uh, practices, uh, but uh, but that aren't um, that don't really uh, qualify as criminal acts. So I think they've struck a, a good balance. Now the niqab is another story because we have a lot of debate going on there on whether the niqab should be accepted in this country or whether perhaps it should not, based on security issues. But once again. The whole notion of political correctness tends to dominate all of these discussions when we deal with newcomers coming into the country. And the Western Standard has been very much front and center of that, Matthew, because according to an article I have here, not too long ago, you ended up issuing an apology to a Muslim group that actually accused um, bloggers writing to the, um, the Western Standard of being offensive to Islam. And this is an ongoing issue that we're facing here. Yes, we're talking about the issues of, of what um, the guidelines are, but this whole notion of political correctness remains an ongoing issue in Canada. Can you respond to this? Sure. I mean, there was a uh, our there are bloggers on the Western Standard. These are people that we select to write about um, uh, issues, and then there are commenters. These are anonymous people who can leave virtually any comment on the Western Standard. Uh, before I took over as publisher, the the Western Standard blog was largely unmoderated and unfiltered, and so comments were uh, were left on the site that were truly offensive by any measure, by any standard. And so when those comments were brought to my attention, uh, I removed them. I was happy to remove them, and I issued a, an apology. However, our decision. Uh, our editorial decision to publish images of the Prophet uh, Muhammad, uh, we stand by those uh, decisions. Uh, these were editorial decisions. Um, they were, you know, they, we felt that we were uh, uh, reporting on the news as is our responsibility. Uh, but of course, inflammatory, uh, thoughtless remarks uh, uh, have no place on the Western Standard, and I was happy to remove them, and I was happy to issue an apology uh, for those. Now, when it comes to our expectations of newcomers, I think we all have something to say about this. So far, there doesn't seem to be a whole lot of disagreement in regards to the barbaric acts. All of you seem to agree here. And based on criticisms that could have come forth or may have come forth as a result of these new guidelines, they seem to be fair. But there was one coming from the liberal immigration critic. Maurizio Bellavaca, if I pronounce that one correctly, he was saying that his criticism is this, that it's more what's not included. Now, I didn't quite understand the reasoning of this because he's saying, for example, well, what about white collar crime? But I will say something to his benefit. Those types of arguments have been made to try to gloss over some of the standards that we see coming into the country. For example, even in the area of barbaric acts, there are still those that are not, they're not owning up to the whole issue of honor killings even though that it's been openly declared as a problem by Amnesty International and it's recognized as rooted in certain ideologies and doctrines, it's still seen by some as, well, it's, it, it's domestic abuse. Yes, it may be domestic abuse, but it's also rooted in ideology. And based on this liberal immigration critic, do you think he's trivializing the entire issue here about, about newcomers coming into this country yeah, and expectations? I, um, George? Yeah, I mean, you don't, you, don't want to be, you don't want to make it like a Christmas tree where you include every of violation of the law. I mean, that, that should be taken for granted. And there's no reason to believe that immigrant groups are more likely to engage in white collar crime than anybody Everybody else. Everybody knows white collar yeah, crime is wrong. That's, that's just a criticism for the sake of a criticism, I think. 
but I think it, uh, as I say, I think the, the, what the problems arise with the adaptation of uh, people to a new culture, for bringing certain cultural practices with them, and also often the younger generation, the ones who are basically brought up and educated here, adapt very easily to Canada. You know, that's, that's usually not an issue. Mm -hmm. The problem is with their parents or their grandparents in some cases, or the extended family, who, are, you know, who don't want to see them departing from the old custom. That's where the problem comes. That's where honor killing arises. Yes. And it's got to be made very clear that these kind of practice, and it, it, I say they mostly involve the equality of women, the treatment of yes. women. It's mostly, it's mostly the issue. And it's got to be made very clear that women are to be treated, you know, are to be mm -hmm. given equal treatment. Yes, Paul? Uh, well, Bevilacqua, it's a red herring, the idea of white-collar crime. White-collar crime is illegal in just about every country. Yes. Uh, honor killings, on the other hand, apparently are not. Precisely. Right. So that's why the difference is, as far as I'm concerned. And, but it is interesting that these things have to be brought up in Canada in some kind of directive to Canadians. These are people who are living in Canada that it's being directed to. And, I think the reason that we end up with this situation is because we fail to judge culture at all. We like to tell the world that we're open to all cultures, um, that every culture is equally good. Not, not Under as multiculturalism, better though, that, that is the meaning of multiculturalism. Right, non-judgment as regards to culture. But that's a mistake, because what you're really saying then is, I have no, no basis upon which to say that one culture is any better or any worse than any other. So if that's true in Canada, that we don't make such judgments, how dare you tell me that I can't you know, uh, have a, a practice of female genital mutilation, for example? That came from my culture. How come that's not every bit as good as yours? Mm -hmm. Multiculturalism fails in that regard. Now, certainly, people should be free to practice whatever peaceful uh, cultural practices they want to. But that does not mean that in the West we say all cultures are equal. They're not. There are good ones and there are bad ones. Now, that is a serious so. argument because now we're getting culture, it. Yes, yeah. and now we're getting into the realms of political yeah. incorrectness, if you will, because we're measuring it here. Is one culture better than another? What about the whole notion of reasonable accommodation in our country? Do you believe, watching, that people coming into this country need to understand certain clarities about what we prize according to democratic views? Let us know your thoughts on it. We're going to go for a break. We'll be back after this. Don't go away.
Hello again, and welcome back to Viewpoints on the Line. We're talking about something very critical regarding our country, and that is the future, if you want to put it this way, of multiculturalism. If there's one thing that basically everybody across the board, board agrees with, this is our future here, because when you look at Canada's birth rate, we cannot sustain even the taxpayer base based on the birth rates that we have, which means we're heavily reliant on multiculturalism. The question is, we're founded on certain rights and freedoms according to our democratic history, and as proposed by Paul McKeever here, when we look at the new guidelines for immigrants coming here, one thing's very clear, we're not gonna tolerate any barbaric acts, and for the most part, our guests agree on that. But the question remaining is, when you start looking at various cultures, reasonable accommodation, do you believe that one culture is better than another and perhaps we should do better in our screening process in the first place? We're going to be tackling some of these issues very shortly, but let's first go to you on the phone lines. Very important to hear from you. Kathy on line 7. Hello, Kathy. You're on the line. Hi, Christine. I'm glad you brought up multiculturalism. I was all for it about 10, 20. 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. However, my views change. It is projected that in about four decades, uh, our country will have over 100 million people. Now, if they are already calling for Sharia laws in, in Europe, where the population uh, of these immigrants are in the tens of millions, what is going to happen to our laws if we are bringing in more people? Yes. And they say, well, forget your laws. I'm here in Canada. I'm Canadian. And we want to impose our laws because then the shoe is going to be on the other foot. And when you mentioned that we need immigrants to support the aging population, but not at that rate, it's just uh, too much, too fast, and it's not fair for the people who are coming from totally different cultures with yes. entirely different laws and rules and way of living to expect that in the first generation... Kathy, bringing out something very valid here, and I'm going to direct this one first at Matthew Johnston, publisher of the Western Standard at West. But there's one thing I want to add to that, what your concern is. Now, a lot of people aren't aware of this, but there was a Declaration of Human Rights agreed upon by the Organization of Islamic Conference back in the early 90s. And what this stipulated was that human rights is only to be defined and seen through the eyes of Sharia law. Now, with this declaration adopted by the OIC and being promoted by the United Nations, we're at a point now, and we're seeing it happening in Europe, where Sharia law is being adopted by certain areas. And some might say, well, it's not the same brand that we see through the Middle East, but it is a source of concern. And listening to what you just said, Kathy, I, I want to hear what Matthew Johnston, the publisher of the Western Standard, um, would have to say about this concern. Matthew, go ahead. I mean, it's a very legitimate concern. There's a natural tension um, uh, between uh, this desire to have freedom of mobility and also this desire to be able to define and uh, protect our own culture. I mean, we just saw the 20th anniversary of the fall of the Berlin Wall. I mean, we see it as a symbolic um, uh, uh, some symbolic of the collapse of communism, but it was also, in a very practical way, uh, removed a barrier to mobility. So uh, it seems to me that Westerners or, or people with Western liberal values uh, see the value of uh, of mobility, um, the freedom to uh, um, you know the freedom of mobility. So we, we somehow we have to balance that with our desire to to shape our own culture, to uh, to protect our institutions. Uh, the democratic process is is such that. Uh, uh, you know, our, our laws can change um, if our population changes. And yes. I, I think there has to be, on behalf of the government, there certainly has to be a better uh, uh, commitment to some fundamental rights that define us as Canadians and, uh, and, and really define us as, as Western liberals, I suppose, in the, most, in the broadest sense of, of what that means. Now, Dr. So we Brecken, need, uh, yes. As a political scientist, Dr. Breckenridge, well, the, how do you respond? All the, all the studies show that the vast majority of immigrants, even when they come from very different cultures, adapt quite easily. I mean, part of that's part of the reason why a lot of them come here. They, you know, they want more freedom. Most they want, want it. To Most do. Yeah. And so we, the, the number of the proportion of that population which in, which indulges in these so-called barbaric practices, is very small. It might be very small, but the power of these special interest groups yeah, and but lobbies. But the younger generation, you know, almost is entirely adapted. 
you know, it's not, it's not nearly as much of a worry. It shouldn't be nearly as much of a worry as people think it is. If we look at our history, if we look at American history, and where the same process is going on, immigrants do adapt. Matthew, you want to respond to, the, to this? To the local culture. I mean, it's the, uh, uh, the degree to which it's a worry is the degree to which we're prepared to defend our own values. I mean, what's so powerful about the, the statement that, we, um, uh, that the Canadian government has issued about barbaric cultural practices is that it's free from political correctness. It's free from the cultural relativistic language. It, it's a very clear statement which is encouraging and important. So we don't have to fear um, a wave of, of new immigrants as long as we're prepared to defend uh, our culture. And in Canada, uh, that means, I guess, first and foremost, d defining what it means. I mean, there's a kind of multicultural Culturalism, um, in a way, is is not a culture itself. It's sort of a, this view, as Paul uh, mentions, that that all cultures are equal, which is not uh, how Canada uh, was was founded. Th those aren't the values that define us. We're are essentially all cultures equal? Western. This is a critical question. According to multiculturalism. Yes, if you look at multiculturalism, though, and the definition of multiculturalism, it would appear by the definition itself that that is what is being stated that all cultures are equal. And I'm curious what your feedback is. Are all cultures equal? Or are some cultures more superior, well, superior to others based on their very values? I think it's the standard. You have to, in my view, there's... Sorry, go ahead, Matthew. There's no question that, sorry, there's no question that some cultures are better than other cultures in terms of, you know, do they maximize individual liberty? Do they maximize prosperity? Um, you know, do, uh, do they maximize peace? I mean, we can look at cultures and ask those questions. I mean, there's just no question that some cultures have achieved more success than others. And uh, we, I mean, it would simply be absurd to suggest that all cultures are equal. And it would be dangerous and suicidal on our part to, to treat all cultures a, a, as equal. I think we need to defend Canadian values proudly and yes. to welcome uh, newcomers to our country and give them the opportunity to achieve what we've achieved here in Canada. Give them that opportunity. They don't want to drag uh, these uh, barbaric practices uh, to, our, mm -hmm. uh, you know, to our country. They want yes. to uh, be free from those, um, from those practices yes. as well. So let's give them that opportunity. Paul, you were going to say something? Well, uh, it's very important to determine the standard by which we say, you know, is something equal or better. Or mm -hmm. I, I prefer not so much equal or better, but rather uh, good or evil. I mean, those are, we're, it's a moral standard that we should be applying because morality is about what we ought or ought not to do. That's, mm -hmm. And so in a Western society, in Canada, what ought people to be free to do and what ought they not to be free to do? That's a moral question. Mm -hmm. And we judge, we judge cultures not by, you know, whether someone wears wooden shoes or uh, a feathered hat, but rather whether they are good or evil. And uh, what we ought to be doing is impressing upon the, the whole world that Canada is a place in which evil, will, uh, evil is uh, not uh, valued and, and good is. And good, good as defined by rationality, reasonable, self-interest, the pursuit of one's own happiness, and the freedom to, to pursue that happiness according to one's, you know, the, the dictates of Without one's own rationality. Without treading on the rights of others. Well, it implies exactly. that, because as soon as, you're, as soon as you're acting rationally, you are, you are acting independently of others. Yes. You're not making others the source of your, your happiness. You're okay. generating your own happiness. So here's we're gonna, what we're going to do before we go for the break, because you waiting on the phone lines, it's very important to us to hear what your point of view is. We're going to get to a few of you before we go for our break, okay? So let's go to Ian on line six. Hello, Ian. You're on the line. Thank you very much, Christine. I'm calling to ask your guest a question. How are you? How are we as a country, Canada, going to police uh, the, 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 um, the this barbaric practice? You, you're talking about the female genital mutilation. It's a terrible barbaric practice. I've been aware of it for years. Thousands of immigrants are coming in from certain parts of the world that are, that are bringing this culture into Canada, and you, you cannot police it because they, they have their own doctors, and uh, they, they, it's their own, like I call it, their own infrastructure. And, uh, but you will, we will never get to see it. It'll go, it'll go on, and, there's a t and, and nobody's going to talk about it. Ian, From I want to thank you for that no call, because um, you bring up a good point here. How are we going to police this? I've made a note of what you're saying, because I promised to get to a few of you on the phone lines, and that's something we'll address later, okay? So thanks for your call. Burnett on line five. Hello, Bernadette. You're on the line. Um, my parents arrived in this country years ago, and they had to work. And nobody else does, do they? You arrive in this country, and they hand you over a store. My parents had to work for that store if they wanted it. Yes. So your view about immigrants coming here, do you have something specific you want to say about this? Well, I'm just upset about my parents. 
They had to work hard. And these other people walk in and get handed everything. Um, Bernadette, that, that's not really so. Now, you're looking at two streams of people here. You're looking at a refugee stream of people coming into this country versus immigrants that come here, and they're very hard working because just like when your parents first came here and they worked hard for what they had, they too were immigrants. Yes. But Bernadette, I'm not going to um, offset what you're saying here because working hard is a critical issue. Many people are under that impression that people are just coming here for freebies, something we have to address again later. So thanks for your call. Andy on line four. Hello, Andy you're on the line. Yeah, hi, Christine, and hello, panel. Uh, just a very quick observation on my part, uh, that, and that is, you know, like you're talking about reasonable accommodation. Yes, a lot of uh, cultures have come in and settled in, in Canada and uh, uh, accommodated very well. But who accommodates the who? Nowadays, with a lot of cultures that are coming in, we have to accommodate to them or else, you know, like even our police have to, you know, the police can't touch them, you know, or stop them or anything, you know, like, uh, wh where's the balance? Great point, Andy. Something else to discuss. Julianne on line one. Hello, Ju Julianne, apparently. You're on the line. It's Julian, actually. Julian. Okay, hey, that's what they wrote for me. Um, well, I have to agree with Paul that there is no better or worse than anyone else. Um, the reason for my comment is that I'm actually the daughter of a Middle Eastern man and white woman, and um, the thing is, some people feel that they are superior to, let's say, my father, because their family's German or something. Mm -hmm. And that really brings up another point that they gave people like Amon Get and Helmut Overlander, the royal treatment when they came over as Nazis. And sometimes my dad will get the shaft. He never says anything, but... Julian, I'm glad you called in with that, but one thing I want to make clear, according to what Paul was saying there, he wasn't talking better in terms of racially superior or depending on what country you're from. He was talking specifically about, and Matthew, you alluded to that, about whether you appreciate people's human rights, that women are not a piece of garbage as seen by some cultures, that you promote peace. Basically, qualities that we prize as, as very valuable according to our democratic roots. That, that's what he was referring to. Once again, our lines are open. We'd love to hear from you. We're going to go for a break. We'll be back after this. Don't go away. It could be the battery low. It's all muffled, but it's okay. I can hear you, but it's all muffled. His question related to, to accommodation of Apology. Oh, beautiful. What was it? Just you had to flip it up and around your ear. Oh.
Welcome back to Viewpoints on the Line. Once again, our lines are open, and we heard from quite a few of you very valid comments. And what I'm going to do here is turn it over now to our three guests to find out if any one of you uh, really made a point that resonated with either of our guests here that they'd like to reply to. And I know that, Paul, you wanted to reply to the lady that talked about one culture better than another. Right. Yeah, she points to an excellent point. Uh, one aspect of a bad culture is that it, it bases its value on race or on uh, the, you know, the history of, I mean, one uh, German uh, is not necessarily uh, good just because some other German is good. Uh, one person from, I'm not sure which country she said uh, her father was from, um, is not necessarily good just because they're from that country. One's race, one's nationality means absolutely nothing with respect to one's value. When I say value, I'm talking about moral worth. I'm talking yes. about the, the capacity and the decision to use one's mind to be a, pro a productive, peaceful individual, that's a superior culture. Uh, an inferior cu culture is one that makes slaves of one another, that seizes wealth from one another, that's built on the envy of the good. That's, it, these are the, in my mind, inferior, not only inferior, uh, as I say, evil cultures. Mm -hmm. the, and, and Western culture should be one in which the individual the independently thinking and productive yes. individual yes. is regarded as good. But one of our callers also indicated, how do we even police this? You've got people doing all kinds of things in back alleys, if you want to put it that way. Even in cases of what we've seen, uh, thank goodness, few and far in between as far as we know with honor yeah. killings. But you've got practices going on that really, is it really possible to police, do you think? Um, well, it's difficult to know how much, how much of that is going on. Well, well you don't know, you don't know. Too much, but some of it comes out in the schools, you know, with the children yes. and some neighbors and sometimes you know, so you're never going to eliminate everything, I don't think. Yes, Matthew, but, what do you yeah. think of the reasonable accommodation one brought forth by Andy? That Because recently it came out in the papers that a police force actually apologized for patting down a Muslim woman because it was only the guys there at the time. The chief ended up issuing an apology that, hey, we didn't accommodate your religion. What do you think of that? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a challenging one. I mean, obviously, we won't, uh, we can't accommodate violence. We can't accommodate criminal behavior under any circumstances. Um, but when it comes to accommodating, uh, you know, different cultural practices, it, it's certainly trickier when, uh, when you're dealing with security issues or policing issues. Obviously, we have to give our police the the authority they need to to do their jobs and to ensure that um, you know people do obey just laws. Um, you know, but, yeah, but as far as you know, issues like um, you know. Uh, turbans in the RCMP, for example, that was that's an old issue, but certainly that was a, that was one that really uh, inflamed uh, people. I think that more or less is a reasonable accommodation. I mean, you know, it's um, it doesn't diminish the um, the value of our police force. It doesn't uh, make it impossible to do their job. It's a small accommodation. The accommodation you mentioned about uh, you know um, searching someone, uh, a Muslim woman who's in uh, in the traditional garb. I mean, police have to be able to do their job. So that would be not a reasonable accommodation in my view. I, I guess there's no simple answer to that uh, except to uh, on a case-by-case -case basis and ensuring that uh, we do uh, enforce our laws and we need uh, and we give police the tools yes. to do that. Fair, yeah. common sense. Dr. Well, Dr. Nice you're saying. I mean yeah. we do have our Canadian culture and it has to it has necessarily had to change a little bit you know as different groups came in, come in yes. and that sort of thing. But it's, it's one which the vast majority of the population supports and it's one which most immigrants embrace. I mean so the, the problems, I think, are mostly fairly minor. We've done, you know, a, a pretty good job. Not that there aren't any aren't problems, there are. But, you know, most people want to adapt to the culture. And immigrants coming here are often very hardworking because you see, yeah, you see medical yeah. doctors that don't qualify when they come here. They drive cabs. Sure, you see engineers, right. even exactly. lawyers. So the, the issue about laziness coming here, I, I don't think I that... Don't think refugees that. may be another story. I'm not, we're still working with those. But yeah, immigrants but coming here being lazy, I, I, I think that's a, it's a stereotype. It is, a, it is a, a negative stereotype, which I don't think is true. I don't think it's ever been true. Any of you think it's Canadian true? History. No, it's not true at all. And, and what it comes out of is this, you know, as soon as you collectivize any service, and I'm, in Canada, the big one's health care, and it, you will necessarily have a rationed system. And as soon as people come into the country, the rations will get smaller. And so naturally, the people who are here already get all upset about the people who are coming in, and they blame them for coming in for freebies, when in fact, it's everybody who's getting a so-called freebie at the expense of whoever's paying for it. The person paying for it, of course, is the taxpayer and ought not to be. If every person were responsible for their own health care, for example, 
uh, there would be no hatred of the newcomer. The newcomer hatred comes from collectivization of services. You don't believe in universal health care, though. Absolutely not. And, I, and partially because it causes that racism, collectivism always devolves to, to racism. I'm curious to hear whether you're in support of the HST, and we're going to be going to that shortly. But first, let's go to Showgig on line six. Hello, you're on the line. Uh, hi there. Hello, go ahead. Uh, hi there. Actually, I'm calling regarding this uh, issue, and uh, I heard uh, Mr. George that saying uh, it's not a big deal, it's not a danger for a danger of uh, for our future. And uh, I, I'm sorry, but I disagree with that because uh, these issues and this culture uh, doesn't matter how small they are or big. They are growing fast, and uh, the thing is. Uh, uh, they are really a danger and threat for our future and our values and freedom. Because the thing is, their religion, in their religion, if you look, they are against freedom. And they want to change Canada and the Western. They come uh, know, uh, by knowing that this is a free country, but yet they want to change it. And if you see that in England, they, uh, it was a demonstration saying we, we are against the freedom and these things. Okay, well stated, because we, we've seen it with the Human Rights Commissions. And Matthew, you might want to respond to this, because the Western standard has taken it on the chin from the Human Rights Commission. And according to what Shogig is saying here, that yes, you do have a small number, and it's important to, to understand. You don't stereotype all Muslims because they're Muslims, because of a small number. But this small lobby has proven itself to be quite the force to reckon with in our country. And Matthew, your response to Shogig's concerns? Um, you know, it's, it's a legitimate concern. Uh, you know, culture is, uh, is, is certainly critical to, uh, I mean, we won't preserve, um, you know, uh, Western uh, liberalism. Uh, we won't preserve things like property rights and individual rights and, and other things um, if we invite people um, from uh, other countries or cultures where they don't support those things. Uh, or if, if we are to uh, sustain those those values, uh, those can uniquely Canadian values or, or North American values or Western values, whatever you might want to call them, uh, we have to be prepared uh, to defend them. I, I think that uh, it's less a concern that we're inviting um, immigrants in from, um, from diverse cultures. It's more of a concern that we're not prepared to defend our own cultural values. Because I think if we believe that, uh, that Western values or, or the, the, the values that um, the panel has defended are good values or, or um, values that are that they're optimal and, and create prosperity and peace, then we shouldn't uh, be afraid to, uh, to advance them. These, these values will be embraced by all, all people because everybody wants the same basic things in life. They want their children to, uh, to, to be prosperous and to grow up in a peaceful society. I mean, you know, we're not that much different. And so invite people to Canada, defend our own values uh, proudly, and, uh, you know, and, and, and be a, a rich and diverse um, uh, country. Well said. Grace on line eight. Hello, Grace. You're on the line. Hello. Yes, go ahead, Grace. Hi. Uh, um, uh, what I see is that uh, as uh, we human, under, as the sun, we are human, nothing uh, uh, color, uh, we are one in the eye of the Lord. Um, it is the Ten Commandments, it is about morality matter. To any human principle, that is the way we go. So. Uh, that is uh, after our governor uh, have to address it that. Uh, so uh, this means uh, love your uh, neighbor as yourself. Grace, thanks for calling in. But it's interesting that you'll, you'll mention about the Ten Commandments and the values because our values in this country, the, the bare fact is it's, it's based on, if you want to look at it as the Ten Commandments, Judeo-Christian roots. And that does not exclude welcoming people of the Sikh faith, people of the Muslim faith, but we are based on human rights and such values like you expressed. Thank you for calling in. Now, the second issue that we're dealing with here, take a look at it up on your screen, and it happens to be the HST. A hard sell for new converts, according to the National Post. And as we know, our newly minted leader of the, of the Ontario Conservatives, Tim Hudak, has been loudly against the harmonized tax. Now, the federal government, on the other hand, is poised to actually transfer the money, whichever province decides to go along with this. So far, we've got a few provinces that have adopted it, Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, Newfoundland, and Labrador. But there's still some holding back. And... Flaherty has said that he's, he's ready to sign over help to those provinces. Interestingly yeah. enough, his wife, Christine Elliott, did say that when it comes to the HST, 
she supports it based on lowering the provincial tax in Ontario. So the question is, how do you feel about the harmonized tax? Many are crying foul saying, look, it's just going to put us in a deeper recession, increasing our tax load, and we don't need this. For instance, land tax, that's going to be another thing altogether. But others are saying, well, look, it might be good for the economy, including Dalton McGuinty. So the question is, what do you feel about the harmonized tax? Do you agree with it? Let's start with you, Matthew, on the harmonized tax from Alberta. Well, yeah, I'm uh, happy to be in Alberta where we don't have a provincial sales tax, so harmonization is obviously not uh, not on our radar. Uh, but I generally uh, look at it as um, as a housekeeping matter, an administrative matter to to harmonize pr provincial and federal. Um, you know, consumption tax. And I also generally believe that a consumption tax is a good tax as far as there can ever be a good tax. The idea that um, this tax will stimulate the economy is, is laughable. Um, but, I mean, it, it, it very, uh, I'll, I'll trust um, McGinty for, for the moment and assume that uh, what he wants to do is simply deal with a housekeeping matter to make the ad, uh, ad collecting of the tax that much easier by harmonizing the two. I think the big question remains, though, what will it mean for the, for the average Canadian? And, and we're not talking, no. because it did talk about income levels. The last thing we want to see, at least, I, I, I know you want to see, <laughs> would be a transfer of wealth in, it, wealth in any shape or form. But what does this mean to the average person? Well, Are they going to be paying more taxes well, on I mean, top the, of the tax The level? initial headline is always, you know, tax, more tax. Yes, people don't like that word. But it's a bad word the, now. And, and the, it's partly that it is just a cleaning up of the system. It's also, apparently, it shifts some uh, taxation from business to individuals. But yes. the Liberal government, in order to make it more palatable, has, is giving people an income tax decrease a tax cut in a tax a cut in income tax, as well as adding to a number of exceptions, you know. So that and what's that for know, people who make eighty three thousand and less? I don't know. I, I, don't, I don't know the details. It's most ninety three percent of the population. It's uh, they claim, and so it's most people will get a ta an income tax decrease of some kind. In addition to that, the uh, for the people at the bottom end of the scale, their they, their subsidy is increased a bit. Mm -hmm. to offset the tax. And in addition to that, they're exempting, you know, everyday things like newspapers and cups of coffee and stuff like that. So they're doing their best to make it palatable. I think it's a perfectly sensible notion. You know, it, it, the, the best tax is the simplest tax in many cases. And uh, this is a perfectly sensible thing to do. I don't know, you know, whether it benefits business all that much. But the argument for doing it now is that yes. it benefits business at a time when business needs some help. Mm -hmm. Paul? Well, there are no good taxes, but as bad taxes go, the sales tax is the least bad. And the reason is that you're only taxed on what you actually spend. If you don't spend, you can save, and that's what people should be doing, saving their money and putting it into uh, productive enterprises. Then they wouldn't be taxed on the money that they're saving. But the only people cleaning up with this tax are the government, and they're going to be getting about $13 billion over the next three years, I believe it is. Mm -hmm. uh, they expect these little cuts they're giving to corporate taxation, despite the cuts in the rates, they're actually expecting revenues to go up. So this is a major grab, but the real issue here is not their tax. The, the, the issue is spending. They are spending mm. and spending and spending, and the one thing they're spending on more than anything else, 75 cents, sorry, 60 cents out of every tax dollar, Ontario tax dollar, is spent on one thing and one thing only, health care. And it's mm -hmm. going to explode as the population over the next 5 to 10 to 15 years gets older, ceases to work, and a very small population in comparison is, uh, is uh, forced to try and pay for all that health care in a country mm -hmm. and in a province in particular where all of the industry is being scurried out to places like India and, and China. Mm -hmm. So there aren't any jobs. In this, in this climate, he's proposing raising revenues, increasing revenues. That is a suicidal approach. What he ought to be doing is saying, we need to, this patient needs to be on the operating table, not taking aspirin. And the problem is, the one problem is they're spending too much, and the reason they're spending too much is because they're trying to socialize health care. That's the issue. The, the fact okay. is that universal health care systems are much more efficient than the kind of thing that you got in America, which is much more wasteful. Hmm. You know, it, it takes a much larger proportion uh, of GDP, and it also leaves a lot of people out. I, so we've got to go for a break now, but the big question to you, do you support the harmonized tasks? Let us know. We'll be back after this. Don't go away.
A circle. Yeah. Hello again and welcome back to Viewpoints on the Line. So do you agree with the harmonized tax? And you, you've got to, hey, we're not having a lot of disagreement here, <laughs> but we are having some in terms of the health care. Yeah. But the point is to, um, to be able to raise money for our health care, and I'm talking the concept of tax here. There are those of you that argue that we're already, as Canadians, overburdened by tax. Do we need any more added on? And then there are those that are going to argue, well, what about the aging population? As Paul McKeever mentioned, and it's true, w the healthcare system needs a lot of money here. And yeah. it's not getting any easier as the population ages and, sadly enough, becomes unhealthier, not only because of some of the side effects of aging, but also because of the obesity epidemic that we're seeing here. There's a decline happening. And the big question, is there enough money to sustain the way we're going? And how else do we raise the money to sustain the institutions that we have today? Some say taxes, some say no, maybe more efficiency, accountability. How do we do it? Well, I, I think morality. Uh, you know, you don't steal from one guy in order to pay for another person. You don't? I, no. I, I mean, if, I, if I'm ill, you know, if, I, if, I, if I've accidentally in an industrial accident had my leg chopped off, I don't get the right to pull out a gun and say, give me some money because I want to get my leg sewn back on. That's, that's not a get out of jail free card as far as I'm concerned. Morally, it's just as wrong. You, so, you know, you know, it might be in some kind of macro sense more yes. efficient. I don't know. I don't even think that's true. But that's irrelevant because just because something immoral is efficient doesn't mean you should do it. Yeah, but morality okay. involves more than just the individual. I mean, morality also involves, and always has involved, uh, an aspect of caring for the whole community. Well, that's mm -hmm. the problem. Uh, the, not all moralities do say that your, your first concern is the welfare of others. Some moralities, the one I follow, for example, says that your own happiness is your highest, uh, you know, the, your purpose in life. And that if you want to help others, you are free to do so and should do so uh, to, to extend to, you know, 
uh, uh, goodwill to man, but yeah. you are not required to do so at the point of a gun. That's wrong. But the Judeo-Christian tradition that we were talking about is the foundation of the Canadian culture. It's very strong on the on the you know the need to it, respect the, bigger, the community. You know, what what and, you're saying there, I, to others. Dr. Breckenridge, what you're saying there is so true. But the question is, are we managing? Are we managing what we have well? I mean, we do have universal health care, and I'll be honest with you, if some child the age of 10 or even younger goes to the hospital, it'll be sad to see that child turned away from medical care because yeah. his mom and dad can't afford it. I, I, I do have that soft heart, and I know that some people will say, well, you're a bleeding heart in regards to that. Well, maybe I am a little bit more no. liberal compared to where you stand, Paul, bleeding on this. Part of our tradition. But the thing is, are we managing our systems responsibly, or yeah. are we taking advantage? That's the bigger question. Matthew, your thoughts here. And you're saying yes, Dr. Well, I mean, yes, Matthew, go ahead. You, uh, I, I mean, I generally agree with Paul on the, as far as this discussion goes. I mean, it, it's not about managing the system uh, responsibly. It's unmanageable. I mean, the reason the Soviet Union collapsed and the reason collectivist uh, systems don't work is not because they're not managed well. It's because they're unmanageable. You can't uh, ration health care effectively. Uh, you know, you talk about the 10-year-old boy going to a hospital and, and being turned away because his parents aren't affluent, but right now he's being turned away because there's not enough, uh, there's not enough uh, beds uh, to accommodate this person, despite in Ontario, as Paul mentions, that 60 percent of tax revenue goes to health care. So we do have an, a completely unmanageable system. It will, it will break down. Uh, private health care is our only option. It will work. To, to look at the United States and, and say, well, health care has failed, it's, uh, it hasn't failed because of the market forces, it's failed because of uh, government interventions. No, we're mixing, no, we're mixing many uh, variables here. We're mixing many variables because I couldn't yeah. agree with you more, Matthew. Because when you look at what's happening with the United States in that model, I'm not that much of a bleeding heart in terms of even what we see happening in Europe, where many people are saying there's a big transfer of wealth going on, take from the rich, feed the poor. Uh, point blank. There's a, there's a boundary. And once again, we have prided ourselves on universal health care, and that does not make us anything like the Soviet Union. And I believe that perhaps with accountability, we could be managed. Yeah. But we're seeing a drift moving more and more toward socialism, toward collectivism, if you want to put it that way, economically speaking. But y y I don't see how you could compare the two. You cannot, you cannot allocate resources efficiently if you allocate them according to political mandates. The reason that resources are allocated efficiently in a, in a market economy is because there's signals like pricing and scarcity and supply and demand. And markets find a way to allocate resources effectively every day with thousands of transactions. Okay. When you have political decision making, you get a misallocation of resources and you get bread lines in the Soviet Union for the same reasons people wait in line for, for vaccines and health care in Canada. Are you, for, I'm, I'm, are you it, for taking away universal health care from the point of view of lowering taxes? Are you for that, taking away universal? F absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. I'm, I'm, for, I'm for giving people reliable health care. Uh, I'm for uh, seeing innovations in health care. I'm for seeing prices be driven, mm -hmm. be driven down. But, I mean, you know, we say the same thing about food. W once the government gets its hands on food, av as we've seen in other uh, economies, food gets scarce and food gets expensive. If you let the market handle health care, uh, health care will be affordable and it will be accessible. And, uh, you know, that's yeah. just, that's, those that's, are just basic market Centralization market. is a critical I mean, problem, but there's got to be a balance the here. The American system is the most inefficient and ineffective y yes, system it is. in the world. It is, but there's a reason. And it's getting that. worse. The reason it's ineffective and, and et cetera is that they're, under their system, um, the government has forced insurers to charge uh, in the insured for various services that the insured didn't necessarily want to buy. So because of political lobbying by, say, chiropractors or physiotherapists, they go to the politician, they say, we want you to force people to buy our service. And so people can't simply go and insure themselves for heart attacks and cancer. They're forced to get, you know, dental care and itchy skin care and uh, earache care all insured instead of just paying it out of their own pocket. Yeah. Now, this child, now believe it or out. not, this actually ties in and we can't get <laughs> to the whole, um, the third topic, but the third topic did have to do with, 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 child, with child care yeah. in this country when it comes yeah. to poverty. Yes, we know we can't be all things to all people. There's a balance here. The two of you advocating for no universal health care. You obviously advocating for it. Yes, absolutely. Quick, quick point of balance here, if you can just kind of inject that well, into the it, equation. It, it's true. You want to be socialist. It's though. true that the market, market distributes most goods uh, much more efficiently than government does. But there are some things that the market cannot do. There are some things that the market cannot do. And that government has to do. It's the only way to do it. And a system which has, you know, which has everybody in the system you know, it needs management, it has, has its problems, all the rest of it, but it's much more efficient and much more just
But much more We're moral. just heating up here. We're much just more moral. Moral. The survival of the fittest is, is a little bit of a concern. We're just heating up here, and guess what? <laughs> we got to go. <laughs> Thank you all so much for joining me. <laughs> That's all the time we have for today. See you again mm -hmm. next time. I'm Christine Williams, and from all of us, thank you for watching. Very nice to get